grazie alla simmetria. Um, unfortunately, my Italian is, io ho capito per parlare un po' difficile perché è troppo simile con, con portoghese. Um, I am, as you can see, I'm a Chinese uh, person. <laughs> um, I live in China and I'm here to answer every question you ever had about China. Right? Um, now, about Italy is unfair. You know this. Why is Italy unfair? Culture, amazing culture. Maybe the best food in the world alongside Peru. Uh, beautiful people, stylish people. You cannot have economic growth. You cannot have everything. Forget it, <laughs> right? Um, so the question people ask themselves is, are we going to be using the RMB? Right? Is de dollarization going to happen? Should you learn Mandarin? Now, here is some scary data. We have 42 trillion yuan, which is around $5 trillion already being transacted in RMB. What does that mean? It actually doesn't mean that much, right? I'm going to explain why. We also have a lot of the internationalization of the RMB via swap lines, which is pretty much Chinese lending to countries like Argentina. But here's the thing. When we talk about dollarization, and again, to bring the topic of Argentina, Javier Milei has promised Argentina, that Argentina is going to dollarize. How Argentina is going to dollarize without dollars? Nobody knows, <laughs> right? And it's the same with China. China has, has had a plan to de-dollarize the world economy. And really, it's about insurance. It's about insuring the Chinese economy against economic sanctions like those imposed to Russia, even though I don't think anything like that will happen. However, this plan reached its peak in 2014. And people don't realize that because China is too big. Again, I come from China is the most capitalist country in the world when the government allows it to, to be. People don't understand this, but those who do business with China certainly understand it. The thing about de-dollarization is that it's the same problem as Argentina. How do you de-dollarize without having dollars? And that is the problem in China today. Again, one thing that people don't understand, if you are in Italy, at one point in time, you were afraid that every Italian company would be owned by Chinese. Right? Again, this is real data. China used to be the biggest, the largest purchaser of companies in the world. But that was in 2015, 2016, 2017. As we can see it, today, Chinese purchases of foreign companies is a fraction of what it was 10 years ago, or maybe seven years ago. And why is that? Again, the reason is a story. And I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story in which Chinese state-owned companies attacked the People's Bank of China and forced a speculative attack that made the People's Bank of China change the Chinese currency system. And because of this change, China will not, cannot work in the same way as it did in the past, trying to de-dollarize the global economy. Again, if you are still afraid that Chinese companies are going to overtake the world, well, that may be the case. In terms of trade, again, Chinese companies are highly competitive. To give you an example, now that China is the biggest exporter in the world, 
what is the main fear of the Chinese economy, uh, of, the Chinese, of these Chinese companies? In a recent interview, the CEO of BYD, which is the largest exporter of cars from China, he said, oh, by the way, how many Chinese electric vehicle companies exist? How many do you know? Three, five, ten? There are 50. That's what, that's what I mean. You, understanding China is understanding that these 50 companies don't care about Fiat. They don't care about Mercedes. They care about their Chinese competitors. And here's the thing, this market will consolidate. BYD wants consolidation to happen very quickly because they are the leaders. They are the leaders in EV, and they are afraid that all, uh, another Chinese company is going to overtake them. They are not afraid of Fiat. But here's the thing. What is this story that I want to tell you? And forget the BRICS. The BRICS was a creation of a Goldman Sachs executive. China uses it a little bit as, again, insurance against a geopolitical world dominated by the US. But again, the BRICS are going to be one third of, of the world GDP in five years. But this is only China and India. Russia, Brazil, and South Africa don't matter, even though Russia can create a lot of problems to the world. Another thing that people don't understand is that in capitalist China, all growth comes from privately owned companies. And no, the Chinese government does not control privately owned companies. It doesn't work like this. There are many problems with the Chinese government, but the idea that you have a no powerful government controlling 700 million companies is untenable. Again, the Communist Party is only 100 million people. Another thing that people don't understand is that people overestimate China in the short run and people underestimate China in the long run. What do I mean by this? 500 million people is still live in rural areas, is still live in subsistence. These people are going to be part of the global market. That means two times the population of entire Western Europe combined. Here is something that I created to show you what I mean by this. There are many problems in China. The idea that China doesn't have capacity to grow is not one of them. Again, let's assume that like Japan, China will reach at some point a limit that is a relationship to the US productivity, right? And just so you know, today, the GDP per employed person in China is 25% of the US. If China grows by 5.5% a year, which is not gonna happen, if the US grows only 2.5% a year, which also not gonna happen, the US is gonna grow more and China is gonna grow less, China will not reach 60% of the average productivity in the US until 2052, 30 years from now. And if that happens, the Chinese economy will be three times the size of the Chinese economy today. We are not prepared for that. We are not prepared for a world in which the Chinese economy that already consumes more resources than any other economy in the world is going to be three times as large. Again, this is a simple projection with those data. Again, I was in the IRAD, the Instituto de Ricerca de Defesa, last month, and um, it was open to, to the public, and somebody, a PhD student, asked me, oh, maybe Italian companies should leave China. How, how fast do you think that Italian companies should leave China? And I'm like, what? Why would, Chinese, why would Italian companies leave China? 
why would Italy follow the U.S. in their war, trade war against China? Again, there are many problems in China. And a lot of Italian companies should diversify away from China. But let me show you this data. This is the service per capita in China today, $4,660 per year. This is the US. So if China bridges that gap just by half, the Chinese service economy will be five times what it is today. Again, this is already happening, but again, China, and here's the thing that people don't understand about China. China does not view the West as an enemy. China views the West as an adversary, especially the US. And again, companies have invested in China like China was a rich economy, a stable economy. That was the mistake of investing in emerging countries. You invest in emerging countries knowing that the risks are higher than in, than in rich economies. So the mistake that many companies did was to invest in China like growth was an ending and like Chinese stability was a fact. And it's not, as we know. So let's talk about the dollarization. Let's talk about the internationalization of the yuan. And again, just so you understand, there are many problems in China, many problems that can derail this, not only political leadership, which is one of them, but you do have crony capitalism, an aging labor force, weak financial institutions, debt, oh, so much debt. Uh, weak capital, human capital and technological developments, and the rest of the world. Again, Donald Trump is not something that the Chinese want to see in power in the US, again, although Biden is also not somebody that is doing China any favor, any favors. Here's the thing. What is about the Chinese yuan? And broadly speaking, we have four types of exchange rate regimes, right? And to understand this, let's look at the trilemma, which is what I promised in the title um, of my presentation. What is the trilemma? Countries, and that is the US is in that. Right? They can only choose two and only two out of these three options, which are active monetary policy, fixed exchange rate, and free capital flows. What is the choice in the US? The US has active monetary policy, and the US has free, has free capital flows. Hence, the US cannot have a fixed exchange rate. What happens when you, have to, when you try to have the three? You suffer a speculative attack. The British knows that, know, the British people know that very well after uh, 1992. Again, what, what has Italy chosen? Italy chose to give away its monetary sovereignty. It chose to adopt the euro. It chose to have a fixed exchange rate with other countries in the EU while maintaining free capital flows, it gave away active monetary policy. Again, not that different from the economy of Hong Kong, where you have a fixed exchange rate with the dollar, you have free capital flows, it means that the central bank in Hong Kong does not control the interest rate at all. So, what about China? China tried to avoid the trilemma, and it actually had a reason to do so. However, China suffered a speculative attack that most people are not aware. What happened in China? And here's the thing, even the Belt and Road Initiative, by the way, the Belt and Road Initiative in Italy is absolutely useless. If you don't like it, it's absolutely fine. If you like it, it's absolutely fine. The total investment of the Belt and Road Initiative in Italy is $24 billion uh, over the length, the last 10 years or seven years or whatever it is. Uh, it includes 24 projects of which two projects are buying shares in AC Milan and buying shares in the Inter Milan. Yeah. 
not necessarily something that creates a lot of value to the Italian economy, right? Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is neither good or bad for Italy. It's absolutely irrelevant. Uh, 10 Chinese tourists spend more on Gucci on a Saturday than the entire Belt and Road Initiative uh, in Italy in the last 10 years. What is the Belt and Road Initiative? The Belt and Road Initiative has nothing to do with geopolitics in the beginning. It has to do with geopolitics today. The Belt and Road Initiative is just a way for China to expel dollars for, from its economy. Again, what people don't understand is that in 2000, in 2001, China joins the WTO. In 2001, the Chinese foreign reserves were less than $300 billion. By 2010, Chinese foreign reserves were $2 trillion. By 2013, when the Belt and Road Initiative comes into play, foreign reserves in China were increasing about $100 billion a month. They reach, in 2014, they reach $4 trillion. But here's the thing. In 2013, Chinese authorities believed that this entry of foreign currency in China would never end. And again, why is that? What is, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, my mistake. Why is that? Because China, as people know, China manipulated its currency, and China kept the yuan artificially low. What is the problem of keeping a currency artificially low? It creates inflation. That's why in 2006, when inflation was the big fear everywhere in the world, China starts allowing the yuan to appreciate. Now, it stops uh, the appreciation in 2008 because of the great financial crisis. And again, it allows the yuan to appreciate again. However, it, the yuan was appreciating, but money still kept pouring into China. And that is when China decided that the yuan would become a global currency. Now, what is the problem with the yuan becoming a global currency? The problem is that the Chinese choice of the trilemma is different than, let's say, Italy. China does not give away its monetary sovereignty. China, because it wants to keep an active monetary policy, it wanted to keep a lid it wanted to have a fixed exchange rate with the dollar, then China didn't have capital, didn't have free capital flows. Anybody that deals with China knows that you can bring money into China, it's hard to take money out of China. You can, but it's not easy. However, what is it that happened in 2013? China was about to get $4 trillion in reserves. Chinese authorities said, we need to get dollars out of here. Nobody will ever attack an economy with $4 trillion in reserves. We can allow free capital flows, or we can allow freer capital flows. This freer capital flows brought with with that, the idea of a global yuan. Again, you're not going to use the yuan if you cannot trade it. Here's the thing. Is the yuan a freely traded currency today? No. So no, we don't have the risk of a global yuan unless and only if it becomes a freely traded currency. But what is it that happened? What happened is that in 2015, after the US increasing interest rates, the, and also a slowdown in growth in China, 
the world started believing, and again, Brexit and stuff like this all played a role. People started believing that China was going to go through a hard landing. Now, here's, here's what is interesting. How does a speculative attack happen? The way that it happens is that, first of all, it's not an organized attack. Basically, the idea is simple. If you believe that the government will be forced to devalue its currency, you borrow in the local currency and you buy assets abroad. When the currency devalues, you sell those assets, you bring the money back, and you make that difference, right? Again, when Denmark suffered a speculative attack in 2015 as well, uh, during Brexit, people believed that Denmark would be, would be forced to leave the peg with the euro, that, but in that case, the Danish krona would increase in value, so people would borrow in Europe and would um, bring money into Denmark. So much so that the Danish central bank had to limit, had to establish capital controls, not allowing foreign foreigners to hold Danish public debt. In China, what happened was that the exact same script happened. Companies that had access to infinite lines of credit in China started borrowing massively in yuan, taking that money into Europe, buying companies, buying Volvo and buying all sorts of companies just to bet that the People's Bank of China wouldn't be able to hold the value of the yuan. Which companies had infinite lines of credit? Was that people like me who suddenly found that they could send money abroad? I'm not gonna lie, I did send a lot of money out of China at that time. I also speculated, but I couldn't borrow a million dollars or 10 million yuan or whatever it was. These were state-owned companies borrowing from state-owned banks. And that's why Chinese companies went on a shopping spree. They found themselves able to take money out of China easily. They seized the opportunity to purchase whatever it was. Even if it didn't make any money, it didn't matter. They bet that the People's Bank of China wouldn't be able to keep the value of the yuan constant. And they were right. Just so you know, look at the data. Let's look at the data a little bit. Not this graph, this graph. Look at the, sorry, back, back, back. In one year, Chinese foreign reserves went from $4 trillion to $3 trillion. One trillion dollars left the Chinese economy in 2015, 2016. At the height of the speculative attack, a hundred billion dollars were leaving the Chinese economy every single month. What did the People's Bank of China do? They said, enough. We are going to allow the currency to devalue. We're gonna create a new currency system, but capital controls are back. What do we mean that capital controls are back? It means that today, if you wanna import, yes, you can buy foreign dollars. If you want to buy a foreign company, you have to ask authorization to the People's Bank of China. It is no different than what things were in Brazil, in Latin America in the 80s. By the way, hyperinflation has nothing to do with money supply. Hyperinflation is a complete lack of credibility in the fiscal institutions. And we are seeing that in Argentina today. 
What happens when nobody trusts their governments? They don't want to buy public bonds. And if they don't want to buy public bonds, what is the only way that the government can spend more money than it, than it, than it gets in taxes? To print money, which is what the Argentinian government is doing. So that's, that's very basic uh, uh, fiscal policy, macroeconomics, that, again, I lived in, I, I'm, I'm from Brazil, right? So hyperinflation is something, one of the reasons that I'm an economist is uh, because I wanted to understand all of this. What is going to happen? Again, unless you have a shock that increases credibility, you're going to continue having hyperinflation. And um, that is, that is going to be very hard for Argentina to avoid. And that is the danger of being in the Eurozone. People forgot what the lessons of the UK a year ago. Least trust mini budget was met with such a revolt by investors that the yields on the guilds went through the roof. And she was pretty much forced to resign to regain, for the fiscal institution to regain credibility. That is the danger of the euro crisis. An euro crisis that causes yields to explode. What it, and with all governments running deficits, it's not that it's going to lead to inflation, it's that it can cause massive social upheaval if you need to make a fiscal um, austerity plan on the fly. That is the risk of waiting for the euro to explode if that is um, um, what society wants. But in the case of, in the case of, of China, who was forced with a similar alternative, what they did was to bring back capital controls and actually, and this is what is interesting, remake the entire currency system. So what happens today? Look at, let's look again at the data. Look at the, the value of the yuan in the last few years. The yuan is not a freely traded currency, but today the yuan is allowed to devalue and, in, and to strengthen with market forces. So when the Chinese economy is doing well, the yuan strengthens. When the Chinese economy is doing badly, the yuan, is, the yuan weakens. And again, the government maintains the system is actually, the, the currency can devalue or appreciate 2% in a day. And then the government promises to intervene if the bre that gap is bridged. And, but in the next day, they start from that value. So if it reaches the top, the currency devalues by 2%. The next day, it starts from that value, so it can devalue 2% again. In other words, what the government does is control volatility. The currency cannot devalue 20% in a day, but it can devalue 20% in, in two weeks if the government doesn't want to intervene. More, right? What is the point? The point is that people forget China is an emerging economy. China is not a rich economy. And China today is dealing with the same problem that emerging economies deal with, which is we need to make sure that we don't face a currency crisis. And yes, China has $3 trillion in reserves. Again, these reserves don't change now month to month. Why don't they change month to month? Because the government is afraid that it can lose control over the value of its currency. How can you de-dollarize the world if you cannot ensure that your currency is under control? So yes, there are many reasons to fear China. The global yuan is not one of them. This is not gonna happen because for the global you want to happen, the first thing that has to happen is that the yuan must be freely traded, that China allows free capital flows. China is not gonna do that anytime soon. By the way, another fear, there are many things to fear about China. Again, China is still an emerging country in terms of R&D. China is much closer to Italy in terms of spending on R&D than it is in, let's say, any rich economy. Again, I teach in a, in a, in a, in a, 
in an American top university inside China, there are no top Chinese universities anywhere else in the world. Why? Because China still needs to import a lot of technology. China is immensely competitive, but China is still far away from being um, the top country in the world. Again, the financial system is very complex. You have shadow banking, but that is um, all I wanted to say. There won't be a global yuan. And I like the point that Jens make about the euro losing its, its, its global reserve status because if that happens, then the only currency that is left standing is the US. Unless, of course, somebody wants to hold um, yens. But again, if you, if you believe that Italy is in trouble, the, the, the debt in Japan is just 250% of GDP. But again, net is much less than that, but that is another thing. This is my last book. This is the book in which I explain all of this. It's Economics of Global Business. It ties to what people have said. Uh, these are some of the books in Portuguese. These are my contacts. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Mi piace un poco Italia, poca, poca cosa. Grazie mille a tutti.